allow the mind to download all of its content that means I am free from the past. Free from the time. Free from the known free from all kinds of conditioning that is what I am I notice the breathing process going on all by itself. I am aware of the breathing process. The tummy bulges and falls. The chest expands and contracts. You can nicely relax even this process of life is going on. That is the harmony between the mind and life. When mind is quiet, the life process becomes smooth. When mind is disturbed, the life process becomes uneven. And you are aware of all of that. Now, 
द माइंड इज क्वाइट एंड देर फॉर आई एम अवेयर ऑफ द लाइफ प्रोसेस you can see when the mind is active the life process gets covered up with the mental activity that is how the mind has upper hand over the life process and you are aware of all of that that is self knowledge meaning i am aware of what i call myself when you ask the question why to allow the mind mental activity to cover up the life process when you ask that question already the meditation is on because the mental activity comes to an end and life process comes to the focus just being aware of life process itself is meditation the life process is twofold the breathing in and the breathing out and as you are aware of the process it is even and a bit slow also without any effort in out gives a depth to the awareness of life process in out in out you can see notice a small distinction between the in and the out in is sukham out dukham in the sense that you remain anxious till you breathe in again you see that in is joyous out makes you a bit anxious because you are anxious to breathe in again see the difference
put briefly in is to come out is to come in a very subtle way Sukham, Dukham. You see, you are aware of the cycle of Sukham and Dukham. Neither Sukham is fixed, nor Dukham is fixed. They change ever. Be aware of that cycle. Sukham, Dukham. Sukham, Dukham. This gives an understanding that Sukha and Dukha are fleeting, very temporary or transient, forever changing. This understanding of the cycle of Sukha and Dukkha, the first hand understanding, the direct perception of Sukha and Dukkha, as fleeting, as transient. liberates you from the cycle of Sukha and Dukkha. I'm aware of the breathing in and breathing out. And I am aware of the cycle of ever changing Sukha and Dukkha. Relax. Sit at ease.
and relax. Now slowly open the eyes. Before I forget, today evening class is at 6. Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihe Om Shruti Smruti Purana Nama Alayam Samame Bhagavat Pada Shankaram Panchakoshadi Yogena Tattan Maya Ivasthitaha Shuddhatma Nila Vastradi Yogena Spatiko Yatha. We begin a new line of inquiry within the understanding of Atma. Atma Bodhaha. Bodhaha is understanding and within that understanding of Atma, Atma, Self. Self is yourself. You should not keep a distance. Like here I am, I am trying to know about the Self. See the distance between the two? That becomes an intellectual exercise. Like here I am and I want to know this topic of mathematics. Mathematics has many topics. A set theory is an important part of mathematics. So here I am, and I am now engaged in study of this set theory, which is an important part of mathematics. That is necessary in life. We do all that. That is how we come to this point where we are, as we are where we are. Like somebody is an engineer, somebody is a physician. So this is how we arrive at that point. It is important. Who can say it is not important? So in that, what you do is, eh, you acquire knowledge. Set theory, you acquire knowledge. How to acquire? Uh, attend a class, read a book. Again, Shravana Manana. Maybe contemplation is not there, but Shravana Manana are inevitable. And you acquire that knowledge. And what will you do with that knowledge? Like uh, you acquire many things and uh, put all of them in the garage, you know. <laughs> you have to look at the garage to see or to understand how people go on acquiring. Garage is enough. Then further go inside, there is a further acquiring. This is what is called accumulation. People want to accumulate. They have that uh, accumulative spirit. And uh, that is uh, uh, created, uh, nurtured by the consumeristic society. The uh, the corporates, uh, corporate organizations, the business people, they create that sense of accumulativeness in you. In Sanskrit, there is a nice name for it. The yoga people know the name, parigraha, that is accumulation. And uh, it is not about how many physical objects you are accumulating, that is not the point. The point is that uh, spirit of accumulativeness, that uh, uh, that vasana, the vasana, you know, deep rooted uh, samskara, deep rooted uh, predilection, if you will, that is there with us. 
we accumulate. For example, I know many Vedanta students, very good meaning people, very sincere people also. They have so much love for Vedanta, but that love for Vedanta takes an interesting expression. It, it comes out in an interesting way of accumulating books and CDs. So they have a library and also they, they call it a CD library. They have all the CDs and all the books. They go on accumulating. And you see them, any time you look at them, they are accumulating. Any time. Sometimes I advise that you have accumulated enough, see whether you can uh, make use of what you have already accumulated. There are some people who accumulate languages. You must have heard, eh? oh, that uh, that person speaks seven languages. Means he was accumulating. And uh, there are people who speak 18 languages. Means they are in the process of accumulating the language skills. This is how we live. In uh, physical objects we accumulate and uh, they become clutter in garage, in the house and finally in the head. That's why uh, in yoga they have advised uh, Parigraha, don't accumulate. How many shirts you need? Maybe three, four. Maybe cello. Sometimes washing can be delayed. So wash every two days you have to wash if you have only three, four. Otherwise you become anxious. And therefore, better you have five or six or six or seven. Or maybe ten. <laughs> but at that point you should stop. You don't want to accumulate further. So, uh, this is important because uh, the physical objects not only accumulate in the garage and in the house, they accumulate in the head. And so, the physical space gets cluttered, but, al but also the mental space gets cluttered. And therefore, Yoga Patanjali Maharshi advised Aparigraha as Yama. He Yama Niyama. Five Yamas and five Niyamas. Yama is constraint. That is the translation. Restraint. Not constraint. Also has similar meaning, I suppose. Restraint. There are five. And a niyama regulations, restraints and regulations. So there is a tendency to acquire, to accumulate, hold back, restrain that tendency. That is called aparigraha. Even Ramana Maharshi used to give a lot of importance to aparigraha. Now this tendency which we have towards the worldly objects, Many people, particularly the intellectual class, have a very similar tendency towards knowledge, towards knowledge. They accumulate. So, that is one effort. It is laudable. I am not questioning its meaning or validity. But when we come to study of Vedanta, what is this study? What is the nature of this study? If uh, the person is not properly cautioned, then uh, by habit, you convert this study also into the normal kind of study which is accumulative in nature. In any type of study, you accumulate the knowledge like you accumulate the physical objects. And uh, because you like those physical objects, you have a attachment to those physical objects. Uh, some people may say, we love. Love also, they say. You may say, it's all right. 
you love those physical objects, that's why you accumulate them. And then, uh, when it comes to the intellectual class, they accumulate physical objects, all right? But equally important, sometimes even more important, is accumulation of knowledge. This is this tendency that everybody has. And it is very useful tendency. So bear with me, I am just pulling, pushing, pulling on the same thought process. So we need to accumulate a few physical objects, you know, you need to accumulate. You cannot dismiss it, it is altogether unnecessary. You need to accumulate. But then you need restraint, yama, aparigraha. Otherwise, it will become overwhelming under this accumulative spirit may cause enormous trouble to you in life. Enormous trouble. Therefore, you need restraint. Then, come to the knowledge, accumulating knowledge. That is very useful. You are a professional because you have accumulated knowledge. You drive a car well because you have accumulated the knowledge of driving the car. You know all the details of the car. You know when to accelerate, how to accelerate. You know when to brake and how to brake. All that you know, that you have accumulated. And you need all of that. We are not saying it is uh, meaningless or worthless or useless. No, nothing. Uh, it has its value. But the question is, uh, do we have to exercise the restraint there also? There is one question. The answer is yes. Because uh, it is not you. It is uh, a faculty only. Legs, it is a faculty, not you. You use legs. You are not the legs. Hands, another faculty which you use, but you, you are not the hands. Eyes, you use, but you are not the eyes. Then emotions, you feel them, but you are not the emotions. Then the intellection, the process of accumulating knowledge and storing it, called intellection. It is the noun. To the verb is intellect. Intellect is a noun also, but here it is verb and the intellection, that process. Intellection, you need it, certainly, but you, it is what you use, the intellect you use, the process of intellection you use. And that is how you made a career for yourself, you use it, it is not you. The day it becomes you, you lost the game. You have to take care that intellection doesn't become overwhelming. And you have to take care that you are not the intellect, you are something more than the intellect. All these are very weighty matters. And we have to examine these things very carefully. Therefore, now I make a proposition, the accumulation of knowledge, though it has a very important place in day-to-day -day life, in our professional life, in family life, whatever name you give to it, it has a very good place and it is very important. The same accumulation you are likely to bring in to the Vedanta, and there it becomes an enormous obstacle. Here it is not the accumulation of knowledge. That is what you are doing. So you have, no, you have to know the difference between accumulation of knowledge and then what you have to do in the context of Vedanta, if it is not accumulation of knowledge, then what it is, how to describe it, I will give it a name. The name is learning. 
Therefore, when it comes to Vedanta, it is not accumulation of knowledge. It is learning. That is important. Of course, it is in the language of Sanskrit, the verse, I have knowledge of Sanskrit, that is accumulation. And therefore, I know the meaning of the verse, that is part of the accumulation. But you have to go beyond the language and its meaning and reach beyond the expressions and arrive at a point when you learn about yourself. It is learning about yourself. And uh, you are, uh, these things I must have covered, but again I am covering uh, one more time, because we are entering into a new topic altogether on Atma. So, you understand one thing clearly. The day you understand this, one of the wonderful nuvans you caught hold of, you got it. And that is, learning doesn't accumulate. That is the fundamental difference between learning and knowing. Knowing accumulates. Learning doesn't accumulate. Okay. One Mahatma used to say, Hindi, Vedanta seekte hai, jante nahi. Eh, means they accumulate well. They study two years, three years, four years, five years. They study. Sometimes, um, they give up a profession and study Vedanta. It is like changing from one profession to another profession. People do that. You know, one doctor who was internist, but changed it to psychiatry. That is the, so worked as an internist, am I right? So that is one profession, medical profession. For 20 years, internist. Then for some reason, I felt like changing over. And so, I took a leave and studied psychiatry for two years or so and became a psychiatrist. And now a new profession. Then similarly, uh, you, both, are in, both are accumulation only. Both are knowledge. Then uh, uh, we come across a similar... <laughs> So, uh, I was studying Veda and the Sanskrit language and literature. That was my first study, all accumulation. Then uh, I have shifted to chemistry and I started a new kind of accumulation. <laughs> so, I myself did that. I can give myself as an example. People do that. And recently, I have come across a physician who is a good physician. Uh, he had a very successful career as a physician and then he shifted to Ayurveda. Another set, another kind of uh, accumulation of knowledge. So, assuming that in the name of Ayurveda they have some meaningful things, okay? It should not become some kind of a belief system. It is likely, that's why I am saying, assuming that it is not a belief system, it is scientific, Most, some of it is scientific, some of it is belief system. So, uh, therefore, uh, the, the person has changed the profession. And uh, all these computer people, they are the mechanical engineers and civil engineers, and now they are computer engineers. Look at them. Because mechanical engineering doesn't get uh, jobs or money as much as the computer engineer. At one time he was mechanical engineering, now he doesn't even know what is mechanical engineering. He became a civil engineer, eh, electrical engineer, sorry, computer. They change like that. So they do that with Vedanta also. They are doing some job, then for some reason they give it up and go and join a Vedanta course. Before that, they will ask my advice. The Vedanta course is announced there, four years or five years or two years. All kinds of courses are there in India. And uh, um, they, they, when you announce a course, you need uh, people to fill it also. 
Like when you put up a hotel, you need occupation. <laughs> Similarly, when you allow a course, you need to people to fill up uh, the the seats. At least some thirty, forty people should be there. Uh, so they are looking for uh, candidates, and these people are looking for uh, a change in the profession, and so they change. This uh, change of profession from uh, another profession to Vedanta, what is its value? As long as uh, the study of Vedanta is uh, one more another profession, like uh, from engineering to you shift to MBA. Similarly, from uh, your regular profession, you shift to Vedanta. What is its value? It has no value. It becomes accumulation of knowledge. And as I was telling yesterday, at the end of the course, you get a certificate. And you can show the certificate to people. And you can declare yourself as an Acharya. And uh, there are always people to follow you. So you too can become a guru. Or Acharya, you can become that. That is all professional. Is that the purpose of uh, study? Is that why we have assembled here? No. What is the value of that? No. Because the day you have converted Vedanta into knowledge that has to be accumulated, it becomes in par with every other branch of science and humanities, it has no value now. It has lost its value. The original value it has lost. Now it has become something else. It is like you purchase a Kohinoor diamond and use it as paperweight. You don't need diamond as a paperweight. A piece of stone or any stone outside a round one, you bring it and use it. You don't need a diamond for that. So, if you want a profession, you don't need Vedanta as a profession. It is not a profession. Shankara did not write Atma Bodha as an accumulated piece of knowledge. So, this is one thing. Before I start this topic, I thought I should bring this point to your notice. I have a feeling I already mentioned this, but one more time I have done it with a little more over uh, with, a, with a little extra enthusiasm. I have put it before you. The beauty, beauty. I'm I'm uh, never tired of pointing out this beauty in learning. There is no accumulation, and in accumulation there is a profession, there is a career, but no learning. And a change of profession from one to the other, what is its value in other fields, I don't know. But a change of profession from the existing one to Vedanta, it is not. It, what is its value, I question it. It is like changing the spouse. <laughs> Somehow, the present spouse is not happy enough. And therefore, by changing the spouse, you will get better happiness. This is the chimera imagination. It doesn't work like that. And uh, changing the profession also the same thing. Therefore, when the people ask me, I want to give up this job, and I want to study Vedanta. So, I, I tell them, your approach is not that of jijnasa. Jijnasa is the love to learn. That is not that is not what I see in you. Your approach is jihasa. Means to get rid of the profession which you are practicing today. That is the jihasa in Sanskrit. Jihasa means it is like the person goes to the lawyer and files a divorce petition. That is, is that uh, jihad? Is that not jihasa? It is a, an effort to get rid of something, right? Get rid of any relation. Now you cannot say in doing so he is pursuing happiness. You never know. 
it may not happen that way only this much is certain you want to get rid of the particular relation that much is certain similarly you want to do a vedanta course means the present uh, uh, profession that you are practicing you are somehow bored with it and you are disenchanted with it and you want to give it up that much is certain whether you will uh, you have the real love for learning is a big question mark over that and therefore i advise these people who approach me and ask my advice i ask them why do you, because i have to give a good advice here i should not give an advice with some agenda i have to give an advice that helps the other person that is the only concern there is no other point of view in mind therefore i see that the it may not help the other person and so from my side i will say why do you want my advice i ask you are you make me commit and then you do whatever you like eh? mm-hmm. eh? so why do you want my advice what you have already decided and then you are sounding me you have already decided and uh, because uh, i am a vedanta guy therefore you are sounding me uh, if in that case uh, i am not giving my advice why do you want my advice are you open for it you have concluded already if it is concluded uh, then why my why should i advise i want advice have a good day i say like that sometimes they understand it and they move on they go and join the course but if they are really open minded i tell them you learn vedanta here you need not leave what you are doing and go and join another course and after the course you will again come to me and ask me now what shall i do these vedanta course people uh, once the course is completed uh, the first thing they have to be settled is uh, the guru has to do something about it the guru has to prepare an ashram and put them there so that they can start their sedentary life of teaching vedanta and if the guru is not willing to do that they will be asking they will put askans in their face now what shall i do what should i do go and jump in the lake <laughs> <laughs> therefore it is not accumulation of knowledge it is learning learning doesn't accumulate that is the purpose of this study panchakosha study i am giving you an introduction to panchakosha study i am not yet done with all due respect because i respect all of you i ask you a question why are you here why are we here let us say we with all due respect i am asking why are we here is it curiosity or maybe there is nothing better to do this morning <laughs> why are you here uh, because nothing better to do therefore spend an hour or so here if that is the reason that you are here oh, no no i don't think so because you have today is a working day you still you have arrived at this hour therefore i i am sure that you must be serious about learning because you have taken trouble to come here some people are have come from outside the town even people from the within the town also they have to take some trouble to come here therefore i i am sure that you are serious serious in the sense uh, you are uh, serious to know to learn no means learn in that sense okay learn about what about the world there there are only three things you want to learn about the world and uh, no that this is not the place i mean assuming that the world is real you want to learn the intricacies of the worldly life then uh, you don't get anything here you want to learn whether world is real or unreal you have come to the right 
place. Then you want to learn about God? Then you have uh, God other than you. Above. You want to learn about that God? Again, you have come, in spite of my dress, you have come to a wrong place. There are many who tour America, nowadays, many gurus, they tour America, and uh, they teach about God. Some, uh, quite often, about gods. Coming from India, they teach about gods. Whereas the missionaries who come to India from Britain, America, Europe, etc., they teach about God and His Son. That is what they teach about. Whereas our uh, Vardis coming from India, many gurus, they come here and they teach gods, not God. For example, some of the gurus, very well-known gurus, they teach about uh, uh, multiple gods. They, they teach you Rama Raksha Stotram, the prayer to do to Rama so that you will get all happiness. Then they teach you Vigneshwara Bhajana so that all your obstacles will be gone. Then they teach you Sri Krishna so that you will have nice prasadam and all happiness in life. So they teach multiple gods. And then some of them teach uh, Muruga. And some of them teach Hanuman. They, they teach a variety of gods. And uh, they, they can uh, readily shift the course, shift the approach altogether and go to Chandika, Chamunda, etc. And uh, some of the gurus teach Shetala Devi. They, somebody constructed a Shetala Devi temple in America. Look at that Shetala Devi. Somebody constructed a temple. There is a temple here. Shetala Devi temple. Do you know what is the vehicle of Shetala Devi? You don't know. But you know the vehicle of Durga. You must be knowing the vehicle of Durga. Vehicle, this is all general knowledge about gods, you know. Uh, so, what is the vehicle of Vishnu? Eagle. What is the vehicle of Shiva? Uh, uh, bull. Okay. What is the vehicle of Brahmadeva? Amsa. Swan. Which are extinct now. What is the vehicle of Hanuman? General knowledge. You don't know? Eh? Camel. She knows. Marks. Ten marks. <laughs> because she knows? Camel. Valmiki doesn't know, but she knows. Don't mind, okay? Just I am saying, <laughs> you must have heard somewhere, all these gurus do these things only. A guru, a big guru, constructed a big temple of Hanuman in this country. Hanuman, 56 feet. And then the vehicle you have to keep before that Hanuman. And they put a camel, big camel. So you go there, you see the camel. What is this camel? Vehicle of Hanuman. Now you tell me, what is the vehicle of Shetala Devi? You don't know? I know. Donkey. Really? Somebody constructed a temple. Shetala Devi temple. So this is, uh, these are the gurus. All stories associated with rituals also. While teaching a story, a ritual will be there. So, is that the purpose of you coming here? You have come to a wrong place. That is not Atma Bodha. You see, you have come to understand, learn or understand about yourself. Why should we understand, why should anybody understand about oneself? People know themselves. How can you say they don't know themselves? 
you have to understand yourself. I suggest people are occupied with themselves all over the world. I'm not saying about a few people or a sect of people. People all over the world are occupied with themselves. You think about it. You look at yourself. Are you not occupied with yourself? Hmm? You say, I love my wife, I love my children. You say all that. And the gurus say, I love my shishyas, I love my rituals, I, my, I love my stories. I love my ashram, this and that. But I suggest people all over the world are occupied with themselves. Look at any person occupied with himself or herself. Hmm? And then I would, I would add one more. You tell me whether I am saying correctly or not. People all over the world, including every one of us, are occupied with themselves anxiously. Anxiously occupied. The mother is occupied with herself in bringing up the children. She is anxious. The professional is occupied with the practice of his or her profession anxious about it. The gurus are occupied with their profession of teaching stories and ritual, performing rituals, etc. And they are anxious too. That enough shishyas are not coming, etc. They are anxious. And they have projects back in India. For that they want a lot of money. For example, a guru who comes here on a yearly basis has projects worth hundreds of crores of rupees back in India. And they, where from they will get all that money? In India they won't get all that money. They get some. If they want food, they will get in India. But money they don't get. They have to get it from America. Because one dollar is equal to 80 rupees. That conversion factor 80. Very important number it is. Very significant number. 80, 80. You multiply with 80, not add 80. If you have 2 dollars, it is not 82 rupees. It is 2 into 80, 160 rupees. So they have projects back in India. They have to build ashrams. They have to do Many big, big organized service activities and they have to do organized belief systems. They have to construct or build. They have to make temples, build big, big murtis. They have to make 120 feet Hanuman made in China. Made in China. Because uh, China people, they are experts, uh, along with other things, they are experts in making big statues. They have that expertise. Because they have made uh, big statues of Buddha, laughing Buddha, belly Buddha, all kinds of Buddhas they have made already. And then uh, Tao, Confucius, uh, all those statues they have made. And all tourists go there. And they see the statue. And when they see the statue, it is a gargantuan, very big statue. How could you make it? They make different pieces and assemble. And uh, there is so much of technology involved in it. Not only architecture and artist, art, art uh, but technology. Because different pieces you have to make separately and assemble them. And it, look, it should look a unified figure, not a different pieces. And uh, when you want to do any such th thing, better you go to China and take their advice. That is what our gurus do. They travel to, first they travel to America, get funds, and then go back to India, travel to you know, China, and uh, there uh, they, they meet uh, the architects and the, uh, and the manufacturers and uh, get all the details worked out. And then they come back home 
and all these pots are made in China and they are transported to India and uh, it's a, and then they are assembled. China people come and assemble. We have big, big statues like that. So even the gurus are occupied with themselves anxiously. Do you agree with that? People are occupied with themselves anxiously. You see, every human being here is a representative of the entire human society, of the world over. What you are, that is what a human being in Japan is. That is what a human being in Alaska is. Are you following the line of thought that I am pursuing? So, you, you represent the entire humanity in you. And you are occupied with, your, with yourself anxiously. You see, every human being, you, you represent every human being. Every human being suffers and is anxious, uncertain. That uh, uncertainty is hanging over every human being. Sometimes they are in despair. The children do not come up the way they expect, or whatever you call it. They are in despair. Gets married, and uh, they go into despair very soon. We Swamis, we bless and come out. They invite us for marriage. In fact, they do marriage in the ashram itself. And while making the marriage, they boast. We are getting married in the sacred presence of Lord Dakshinamurti and Swamiji Maharaj has blessed us himself personally. And then nice food and special sweets and all that. We are also part of the party. And within three, four years, they are in despair. Not all. But that is there in the human society. You may say, we are not in despair about marriage. Okay, you are not in despair about marriage, but you are in despair about something else. Okay, I am just giving examples. Every human being is a representative. Every human being sitting in this room is a representative of the entire humanity, which is confused. They don't know what to do. They don't know what is the truth. And they are attached. Now, why all this? Why not teach about Atma? Why all this, uh, what I am saying? This acknowledgement is a, a prerequisite. This acknowledgement that you are occupied with yourself anxiously. You are anxiously occupied with yourself. And your occupation with yourself is not leading to happiness. It is leading to despair, uh, uncertainty, unsettled life, uh, life, and uh, it is leading to a lot of uh, strife and struggle that you are occupied with yourself. And you have to acknowledge that. Do you acknowledge that? When you acknowledge that, that gives you a sensitivity to learn about yourself. Have I made my point? Mm. That sensitivity to learn about yourself, you get. Now, assuming that I have put that sensitivity into you, that is part of the speech, part of the effort, you know. That is how we study Atma Bodha. Assuming that I have put that sensitivity in you, sensitive to learn about yourself. How come I am ever occupied with myself? Mother says she is working for her children, but the truth is she is occupied with herself. Husband says, I love you, darling, this and that, but he is occupied with himself. 
I will give you a diamond ring or a necklace, this and that. But in all that, he is occupied with himself. Same is the case of the spouse. And uh, gurus are like that. What to speak of ordinary worldly people? They are occupied with themselves. You come across a guru, he is occupied with himself. There is one guru who is touring this country, who is occupied with himself. Now his project is to make Saraswati, Goddess Saraswati in gold. 80 kg. That is the occupation. Occupation in the sense he is occupied with himself. That is, he, and he is very anxious about his himself. How much we can take from here or from elsewhere? And what are the repercussions? How to take the money from here to there? So much goes into all that. There is no freedom. People don't know what is freedom. Why? Because they are occupied with themselves anxiously. Therefore, if ever one of us is a representative of the humanity, then if that is how we are living, occupied with oneself, and we are anxious, we are in despair, we are uncertain, then that is a good enough reason to pursue this uh, thing called learning of oneself. So that is the study. This is called Panchakosha Viveka. Okay. So we now introduce the word Koshaha. Koshaha is a sheath. That is what a Koshaha is, a sheath. Like you have a knife or a sword, it comes with a sheath. And uh, as long as uh, even the kitchen knife, there is a sheath for it. If they have some four, three, four kitchen knives will be there. And there will be a stand with the sheaths, wooden. And so the knife is in the sheath, together or separate. And uh, as long as the sheath is there, you cannot make use of the knife, you know. You have to, <laughs> you have to make the knife free from the sheath. Huh? Now, suppose you want God. Okay? You are a devotee. Means you want God. Now that God is in you as Atma. And uh, no, no, I am not so much for God, I am for happiness. Suppose that happiness is in you as Atma. I am not so much for happiness, I want peace and certainty, settlement, certainty, peace. That is what I want. That is in you as Atma. I want bliss. That is in you as Atma. I want fulfillment that is in you as Atma. I want heaven because people are performing rituals to go to heaven. We say that is not about ritual, that heaven is in you as your Atma. I want immortality, suppose. Somebody wants immortality that is in you as Atma. I want Lord Vishnu that is in you as Atma. I want Muruga, that is in you as Atma. I want Ayappa, that is in you as Atma. I want Shiva, that is in you as Atma. Yeah? What is this? Why don't we feel all that? If Atma is a, all of that, why don't we feel it? Because the Atma is a sheathed. Kosha. Therefore, you take the knife with kosha and hold it, and it serves no purpose. The sheath has to be put aside. Then only the knife will serve its purpose. Under this kosha about atma, it is not physical. It is not physical kosha. Some people believe by, they believe like that. What to say? 
by dying we will go to in andhra pradesh in telangana particularly there is a temple called shri shailam where uh, shiva is the god and uh, in that region of telangana districts maybe some andhra districts of uh, Tal- rayal seema are included in those districts there was a, a particular ritual called vera vratam vrata is a particular austerity vera means uh, uh, like a fighting uh, uh, a fighter a soldier a courageous soldier is called vera that is the vera vratam so there are places where there is shiva there and the person goes there with a sharp butcher's knife uh which uh, which does the job well doesn't uh, fail that kind of a sharp well made knife he holds in the hand and then shiva hail out the shiva then uh, uh, came for the fire this and that some kumkuma puja and then he cuts his head and surrenders to shiva so now why why is he doing that because it is told in some of the scriptures that it is the body which is separating you from shiva and if you offer a body to shiva um, so you become one with shiva it is called shivaikyam you are looking askens at my face why you did not hear the story of ravanasura offering one of his heads to shiva this and that such a story you did not hear the valmiki has nothing to do with that ravanasura has offered nine of his heads he has 10 heads and nine he offered shiva did not move he still remained and uh, remained unresponsive then he said what the hell nine heads i have given away anyway now i am giving the 10th head you you still remain unresponsive o shiva about then shiva comes and holds his hand that is the story now he the when the one who has got only one head so is the body kosha like that no it is not about uh, abusing body it is not about hurting the body or inflicting a injury to the body nor it is it, it is said nor why nor so it is also not about glorifying the body etc this is a one kind of cult where body is considered kosha shit and you have to destroy it so that you become one with shiva there is another kind of cult where body is considered sacred and so you glorify the body put a chandanam sandal paste to the body it feels very good give some very good food to the body chakra pongal katte pongal etc etc to the body and put nice clothes to the body and glorify the body then you offer this body to bhagwan what will you do offer means what you do namaskar or whatever but glorification is very comfortable so this is another cult where in the name of god you glorify the god, body so i have considered both pakshas in which one of them is body is filth body is to be destroyed it is an obstacle and in another body is glorious and you glorify both are wrong i i said i will give i will put my money on saint francis did you notice that <laughs> so therefore here it is about why body is a kosha it is by itself not a kosha shankara says kosha eva kosha as do kosha by itself it is not kosha it is kosha only when you identify with it hmm. we have come to what is called identification identification is of two kinds the mine and the me 
you identify as mine, then the body has become a sheath to the Atma, a cover. Sheath is the cover. Not in a good sense, it covers up. It's a cover up. Cover is in a good uh, knife needs a cover, but here it is not cover, cover up. That is the sense of kosha, sheath. So, who made this sheath? You made. This uh, caterpillar, uh, the silk worm, it has a kosha. The silk worm in Sanskrit, it is called koshaka raha. The kumbha, kulala is called kumbhaka raha because he makes parts. Whereas the silkworm is called koshaka raha because it makes the shell, the cocoon in which it binds itself. And quite often it dies itself in that kosha. But uh, if it has a good life, then it will break this kosha asunder and comes out. Therefore, uh, you are the koshakara. That is what Shastra says in Shantipurva Mahabharata. Koshakara ivatmanam na buddhyase. Like uh, that caterpillar or that silkworm doesn't know that it is bound by this uh, cocoon. You are like that. You have created this body around you as a cocoon. All, not in a physical sense, all by identification. Now we come to the topic of identification. Okay? So, every single time you identify, you cover up your real Swarupa. This identification is cognitive. Cognitively means in your thinking you identify. And that thinking is false. You are identifying you should identify with self, Atma. You should not identify with non-self. But you end up identifying with the non-self. You have to examine all this. You have to examine. So, not only you, I have to examine too. So, we should not identify with anything. So, um, all identification you have to examine. And uh, this examination begins with the physical body. And there are five levels of identification. Pancha Kosha. We will discuss this. Okay? Now I will answer a question or two. When I watch my thoughts, they are all in ignorance. That is not called watching. That is called judging. Not watching. That is judging. You already concluded that your thoughts are all ignorant. What do you mean by ignorant? Suppose you get a thought about yourself. So I, I feel like having a cup of coffee. That is the thought comes. Coffee thought comes. Is it ignorance? It is not ignorance. Then is it wisdom? It is not wisdom also. It is a thought. Coffee thought. So what I am supposed to do? You need not uh, do anything. Oh, coffee thought. Be a watchful. Be aware. Then I blame myself. What else? When you judge the thoughts, you blame yourself and get frustrated. This is what I was saying. Don't judge the thought, don't identify with the thought, don't blame the thought, don't condemn the thought, don't praise the thought. You do any one of those things, you are not watching. Hmm? You, you, you should watch. So, how to avoid this judgment? The question is answered, you know. So, you should only watch as a neutral, uninvolved witness. That is what you have to do. Please do that. Okay? Uh, then, uh, since nameless and formless matter energy cannot be destroyed nor created, is it Sat Brahman? Yeah. Matter is Brahman. What you call matter is Brahman. What you call energy is Brahman. 
Why the Rishis worshipped God in fire? By offering oblations and all that. They worshipped God in fire. Agnimide, Purohitam, that is the very first hymn of Rigveda. Why they worshipped God in fire? Because fire represents energy. The best representation of energy. Okay, even the wind is also energy, but uh, that is not a, how uh, you don't even uh, see it, you know. There's fire which is before you, you can see it. And therefore, best form of representation of the power of God, that is uh, fire, which is energy. And uh, what is star matter? Or is it just in the mind? Star matter is also matter. I have a feeling there is no matter in stars, if I know correctly. Uh, sun is not a, a material ball. Sun is not a ball of matter. Sun is a ball of fire. And in the core of the sun, there is hydrogen gas at a very high temperature, which is getting fused every frac every second. That is what the sun is. Therefore, sun is the star. And the star is the energy. There may be hydrogen gas is there, I said. So matter also. All matter is Brahman. All energy is Brahman. Okay. What does the world in Vedanta really mean? Mere mental projection? Yes, you have answered your question. All the answers are in the question itself. Mere mental projection? Yes. As Nama Rupa, world is mere mental projection. As the substratum, as the foundation, it is Sat, which is Brahman. And the world, is it private or universal? It is never private. It is always universal. But you believe that it is private due to ignorance. There is nothing private. Uh, whatever is in your mind, it represents the entire humanity. Suppose you have fear, that represents the entire humanity. You have anxiety, that represents the entire humanity. You consider it as private. Suppose you are fighting with your spouse. You consider it as private. It is not private. Since the day one when the creation came, the, the husband is fighting with the wife. Vishnu was fighting with Lakshmi. What to speak? <laughs> so you think it is private. It is not private. It is universal. Everything is universal. Um. Then this is a Gita question, I will finish this. Uh, war and battles with male warriors. What do you mean by male warriors? There, there in Mahabharata, it is about Mahabharata Gita. In Mahabharata, there is a, all warriors will be male only. Only recently women are included into the battlefield. Israel started it. Uh, women, uh, there is a battalion of women. And in Second World War, even Germany tried it a little. It, uh, Russians have done it, not Germans. Germans, in principle, they did not want women to fight in the battlefield. That is the, that is the Nazi, Nazi uh, uh, ideology is like that. But Russians did not have that. And therefore, in the Second World War, Russians uh, in the East, Russians had uh, regiments entirely uh, consisting of women. And in India, there is a regiment of women soldiers. Now it is happening. Generally, it is not done. Very rarely. When it is done, we, we point out. Because it's an exception. It is not the rule. The rule is uh, women are not soldiers. That is the rule. And uh, here and there, there are exceptions. And Mahabharata is not an exception. And Mahabharata has an LGBTQ warrior also, if you know. <laughs> <laughs> therefore, <laughs> really, therefore, uh, it is all about a war and battles with male warriors. And I know that it is all allegory yet again. You know well. But what about male sensibility? Come on. So, you are now feminist. <laughs> we are Vedantins are beyond the gender. We are neither male chauvinists nor feminists. So I really don't think a bunch of women would be very interested in war or battle. Good. In fact, they would be adverse to it. Very true. And I keep wondering who created all these ideas. This is a story and it is a, it is a, 
uh, an analogy, if you will, and you have to take the symbolism associated with it. And are the ideas skewed toward the male sensibility? There is a such a thing is there. The skewing of ideas, the male shavunism is there very much. Because the society, Mahabharata society, and even today's Indian society, and in my opinion, even the American society, they are all male shavunistic. It is there. Therefore, uh, uh, you see, you are complaining while eating food in a... That is the Telugu proverb. You eat food from uh, a cumbered carpet. You are eating food from the carpet and complaining about the fibers. <laughs> okay? Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnasya